Do you want us to turn it in now or later? Oh, you can turn it in. You can turn it in whenever. Oh, okay. okay. Just whatever's easier. I think maybe maybe during the break might be yeah. easier. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got some a uh, little bit of classwork for you here. You will you will need a calculator for the first question at least. Thank you. I see. This is for air. And while you're busy on that, I'm going to go grab my notebook because I left it in my office. I'll be right back. I think you might get Do y'all have a ch chance to look at the video that I, I posted? Yeah, I, I'm sorry I posted that so late. I, I, in the ideal world, I would have posted that at the beginning of the homework, but I, I, I just am so struggling to keep up that I'm just behind on everything. So uh, I thought better post it sometime than never. So I hope that it helped. Um, at least the ductilator. Uh, video on you know, how to use the calculator appropriately. I actually uh, made some video last year for that, and I, I couldn't find my video. I thought it was on YouTube somewhere, but I YouTube did something uh, over the summer where they, uh, they required you to, if you had really old stuff, you had to go in and uh, basically re-upload it, or it became invisible to, to, to viewers couldn't access it. And uh, I lost some of my, actually quite a, quite a lot of my older videos because of that. It's really frustrating. So I'm, I'm, I'm remaking some video that I used, used to have. <coughs> and the, uh, the, 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 the fan distribution uh, example, I tried to include both uh, the equivalent length method and the loss coefficient method. And um, in that example, you can see you can see that for fittings that have a, like a T or, you know, we can have a T fitting, we can have fittings like this. Um, and uh, I mean, that, that's, these are diverging, that's a diverging Y, but you can also have a converging Y, and with all these fittings, there are uh, there are losses associated with each of the uh, each of the strings, typically, or at least with uh, if you're coming if your inlet is here, um, there's going to be a loss coming out of both sides. And if we have the loss coefficient method, we typically will have a loss coefficient uh, for the branch and a loss coefficient for the straight through section. So we're doing, uh, and, and we'll take this loss into account when we're, we're studying this segment, and we take the branch loss into account when we're doing that segment. Um, in the example that I get, uh, the, the homework problem, you just had an equivalent length, and if you have the equivalent length for the, uh, for the fitting, you only you use that once. And typically for a T fitting, you use that on the straight through segment. Yes, sir. So, on for the last one, yeah. on question one, part A, when yeah. you ask for the air velocity, you need to say feet per minute, please put it at two feet per minute. 
Oh, one A, the air velocity, yes, feet per minute. Sorry about that. That's feet per minute. system, we, we should try to represent the, the branches as they really are. So if we have a 90 degree branch, it'll look like that. If we have a, uh, sometimes we have a 45 degree and it goes like that. That seems like it can get pretty messy with some systems, but they, you might need to make right turns. Uh, do they ever deviate from that and annotate like this is not actually oriented, half oriented how it is on the uh, diagram? No, because the diagram has to be used by the contractor. We have to actually install, so they have to know the angles and elevations. Uh, so you'll have, uh, you know, um, an, you have an elevation diagram to show the duct work at the floor level, assembly level, but then you also have the, what do you call that? The overhead. The overhead. Um, so that, yeah, you have to work with both of those. And yeah, those are done to scale, just like, you know, using. Uh, SolidWorks, but I think you can do duct work design in SolidWorks, I think. But there, 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 there are, are more, there are systems that are more tailored to HVAC design. So yeah, uh, you, you have to rough in your duct work and then your piping uh, goes around that. So it, it can get, it can get pretty busy. Um, but typically, you know, you have the the whole system diagram, which is the P and ID, and then you'll have sub system. You'll have diagrams for some parts of it that will have more, you know, more detail. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the, the, the fittings or losses are just awkward to work with because uh, we just this is all in software now, and when I when I use uh, when I do this, I just dial in my, my fitting, and it uh, automatically does the loss calculations for me. So I'm like, oh, I'm trying to remember how do I do this by hand, and uh, it's actually quite cumbersome to do by hand because we uh, you have to calculate the, these are not given; these are based on uh, characteristics of the of the of the piece of duct itself. So you have to go and look for a a T fitting, and it's a full full flow T fitting versus a T fitting where you know one is section is, is uh, the pipe is much smaller than the, than the other. Uh, but there are standard fittings and you look them up and then uh, and I think they have some in, in our book at the end of the chapter and they'll actually tell you how to calculate these loss coefficients. But to calculate them you need to know the it's based on the diameter of uh, of the duct and uh, the velocities at different points, so you may have to know the feet per minute coming in, uh, feet, per minute, feet per minute going out. And if it's an elbow, we have to know the radius. So there's a, there's a radius of the turn, and typically we have to use the, uh, we, we look at the, uh, the ratio of the radius of the turn to the diameter of the duct. And uh, so just to get one of these loss coefficients, you might have to do several calculations and then add correction factors on top of that. So it can be quite time consuming and, and, and really quite a hassle just to figure out the loss in one piece of ductwork, one fitting. So you can imagine you know, pitting the poor engineers before computers that had to do all of this by hand. Um, and now you can just dial in the duct uh, into the ASHRAE. The ASHRAE has something like 250 standard ducts, and those are programmed into all the major HVAC design software platforms, and you just dial in which duct you need, 
in your flow rate, and it will do all this automatically for you. So you'll be spared having to mess around with this garbage. You still may have to deal with, uh, I mean, that's, that, that, this is fittings in the duct work, but things like uh, filters and, uh, and, and the, the outlets, you may have to deal with separately based on the, the manufacturer of that particular filter or the, the, the outlet. And they'll have tables that will tell you what the, uh, the head loss is through that. Uh, and, and, and typically, these will be an equivalent length. So you just find out what the equivalent length is and add it to the length of your straight duct. Um, but we really, I mean, using equivalent length, that, that I shouldn't have done that. I, I was trying to find a way to ease the load of, of working with the, the, the losses and fittings. Giving back to an approach that I used to use a long time ago, and I didn't even tell you what the dimensions were. Somebody asked me, "Is the equivalent length table of those in inches or feet? What's the unit of the equivalent weight?" And I went and looked at it. Ah, there's no unit listed, and uh, of course it's feet. But uh, this is part of the problem that HVAC is. There's just all these assumptions about units. So forth. Okay. <laughs> It's a lot easier with, with water flow just because the fittings are, are, are standard. It's easier to uh, calculate fitting. Okay. Sorry, to incorporate fitting loss in ground calculation. And I uh, just also want to mention that next week we're going to have two guests uh, guests coming into class. Uh, Tuesday, uh, FSI Engineers is a Seattle-based mechanical consulting firm. And uh, it's, a, it's a group that I, I know very well. And uh, the guy's name is Ola Jar Jar Jarva, Jarva uh, last name. He's Swedish, but uh, Ola. I just think he's a whole lot. But he, he's coming, I think his partner is coming uh, in as well. And they're gonna talk about uh, you know, what it's like to work as an HVAC design consultant and profile actually some of their work, some of their design work in the area. So you get a sense to see what, you know, how engineers are actually applying this stuff out in the real world. Uh, and then this is gonna be an in-person visit. And Thursday, uh, Someone from AB Engineering, which is another mechanical consulting. Uh, they're quite large. 
FSI is pretty much local. I think they may have a, a, one, one other operation in Baltimore, but AB is pretty pretty big company. And uh, someone from there will be visiting us by Zoom to talk about what they do. And, uh, and I've asked her to talk about what they look for when they're hiring uh, engineers to work as uh, in, in, in consulting, mechanical consulting. So the woman here, uh, very active in ASHRAE, and she's a person who often I talk with about, you know, what, what are you looking for in your graduates, and you know, what can we do to better prepare our, uh, our, our students. And, uh, so I think you'll, you'll find it very interesting to hear what she is looking for. And, um, she also hires our graduates, which I like to see. I always like people that not just interview our graduates, but actually hire them. Yeah. And I, I know uh, FSI is looking at some of our students for internships. I don't know if anyone's actually, they, they're pretty small. I don't think they do a whole lot of hiring, but they do bring on interns, and I think they're looking at one of our juniors now. So are they coming to the class? Hmm? Are they coming to the class? Yes. But our class is uh, Monday, Wednesday. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that would be a disaster, wouldn't it? Yeah, they, they come here and they're all set up on Tuesday and nobody's here. Uh, yeah, Monday, Wednesday. Night, today is... Uh, <laughs> then the week after that, one of our former students is coming, uh, who, who's a project uh, engineer at a, a local HVAC. I think he's in Woodenville, and he's going to talk about project management in the context of HVAC work. And, uh, he took this class the first time we, we taught it, so it'll be interesting to see. And it'll be the first time that I've uh, actually seen him in person since he graduated. So you have to look up what your uh, what your friction loss is. So he says it's point one. So you turn it till you have twenty thousand CFM at point one, and then you read off what your velocity and your duct to hand are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what you're doing. So you've got to turn it into, uh, kind of like, so you're at point two. It's really small. It's supposed to go to point two. So it's point one. Yeah, I'm going to make sure it goes to point one. Right here, so 20,000, and then you read off your. At 20,000, you read off your velocity, so it's 1,900 feet per minute. And then if you read off your diameter, it's 44 inches. Oh, no, it's 19. Or 1995, something like that. So he's one of the first students. In fact, I think he's the oldest student that I've been able to maintain. Great. Right. And uh, I lost touch with him in the late 90s. He was Japanese. He, 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 he studied with Japanese American. He spent a lot of time in Japan. So he got the action. And he graduated and lost, lost touch with him. Uh, Five years ago, you're assuming processes, 
Yeah, I can just, if you want, you can just look at it, I don't mind. I don't like having stuff like that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. I thought you multiplied. No, I just, I just have it where I write it out because that's what you call it. still two numbers in the notes. Somebody put in the Okay. 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 Okay.
We need to plug in 18 on the bottom. We gotta plug in 18. Oh, okay. We have to plug 18 in on the bottom. Uh, well, actually, you won't do it there. Your efficiency will be here. So, at a race, it's, your efficiency is. Your effic this is the equation for brake horsepower. If you solve for efficiency, then you swap. Yeah, so brake horsepower, you'd actually have efficiency. Oh, that's right. It wouldn't be brake horsepower. Right? Yeah, so this is the brake horsepower equation. That's the. Yeah, let's, uh, why don't we, uh, let's see, I can, uh, I can move my stuff if you want to put something over here. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Just, uh, sure why it would be on uh, when I come in here. I don't believe it's on because if you would tell it it was, yeah. it'd be making noise. Uh, yeah, no, that's like a silent. Like silent yeah. mode, yeah. Yeah, but there's only lights, so we can't see the light. I would assume they have some sort of timer on it. Or it could be. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let, let's, uh, let's, let's work through this together here. Um, so we've got a fan, a uh, cube, equals 20,000 CFM, static pressure, this is a, um, an abbreviation, a conventional abbreviation for, uh, for pressure, uh, inches of water gauge, um, when you talk about inches of water, it's almost always a gauge pressure, so it's relative to the atmosphere pressure. Um, and uh, let's see, we've got a fan speed. It's turning 500 RPM and brake horsepower equals 18. And let's see our friction. So our system is designed for 0.1 inches of water per 100 feet of duct. So this now, this gives us the ability to use the ductilator to find out the size of the duct. And 
in its velocity. What did you get for the duct, uh, duct diameter? 44 inches. Equals 24 inches? 44. 44. Yeah, I know it's a big duct. It's a really big duct. So we go to the uh, we go to the blue the blue area and we line up 20,000. Oh, I'm on the SI side. So 20,000 CFM is on the outer rim, and we line that up with 0.1. And then we look at the round duct, and it looks like a 40. 44, 43 and a half, 44. That's really big, that's a really big duck. But it's, you know, a really big building. That's like going to have three and a half feet diameter. Yeah, I mean, you get in there and it's crouch down inside of it. So you have to hold Bruce Willis. And, huh? So it's big enough to hold Bruce Willis. The whole Bruce Willis. Sorry, I heard. I don't know why you're saying that. Maybe it's reminding me of something totally practically irrelevant. But it, there, there's a movie. Um, I don't think it's Bruce Willis, but I think it is one of the Men in Black movies. But there. They're driving in a tunnel at high speed. I think they're chasing somebody, and they uh, they go up the wall and they drive upside down. Have you, have you seen that? It is Men in Black. Yeah, yeah they're they're driving at high speed upside down, and the question is, is that possible uh, with the laws of physics? And I actually used that example in a class I used to teach in IAS. Uh, called How Things Work. It was, it was like physics for non-engineers. But I used that example, and we watched the video of it to, uh, to show that, yes, indeed, it, you, 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 you can, in theory, get up to a high enough speed where lift, the lift developed by the car, will actually hold you up, and you can drive upside down. But you have to be going really, really fast. I can't remember how fast, uh, but uh, it illustrates the concept of lift. Um, and of course, when you're when you're racing at high speed, you know you use a spoiler to uh, deflect air, so it holds the vehicle down. Otherwise, you can fly. You, know, you can lose control of the vehicle at high speed. Um, okay, but how do I say it's totally irrelevant? Okay, um, so what's the velocity? We go over to the red, and uh, velocity at twenty thousand. CFM, and I believe it's around 1900. Did you get 1900? Yeah, yeah, it's about 1900 feet per minute. So then B, velocity head, how do we calculate that? Squared, and just remember feet per minute goes in there, and out, out comes inches of water. Uh, so we put in 1900. Um, and we get, uh, I don't remember, 0 0.2, 0 0.22 maybe. Yeah, 0.225. On these larger systems where you get you start to build up static pressure, the velocity head becomes insignificant. And sometimes it's ignored um, in a bigger big system like this. Um, it's just not a lot. And uh, what is the fan efficiency? Um, what is the, how do we calculate fan efficiency? So the air horsepower over the brake horsepower, and um, a brake horsepower is the input. The fan is 18. How do we get the air horsepower? Be the 
CFM times speed per, per times the the pressure loss divided by 16. Yeah. Yes. Right. And the total wall pressure, uh, or PT, is the static plus the velocity. And the static is given to us as 3. And <coughs> we calculate uh, the velocity at this 0.225. So 3.225. So we can come over here, 3.225. And Q is 20,000. And this gives us, uh, let's see, I think, I think it's about 10, if I remember. So that's the actual energy going into the air. Okay, uh, but we're delivering the shaft. The shaft that's uh, that's that's turning the fan uh, is operating at 18 horsepower. So that means our efficiency, the fan efficiency, is 10.15 divided by 18, right? Or 0.56. And that's what then a motor is going to be driving the shaft. Motors are typically around 0.9. So if we wanted to find the motor horsepower or the the, the, electric, or the, uh, uh, the the motor efficiency would be 18 divided by 0.9, roughly. We could even look up the efficiency uh, for a standard motor using, there were tables given in uh, one of the earlier chapters when you're calculating the, the heat, the heat generated by the motor. But we don't have to worry about that here. Okay, so then uh, in number two, we're gonna change the flow rates. Something happens, somebody does something to, to cause the CFM to increase. Um, and Actually, we, we can't just, we're going to have to make adjustments. We're going to have to alter the fan in some way to get 28,000 CFM. And uh, probably we'll increase the speed. But we could also increase the diameter of the fan. If, if, if the cage is big enough that we can put a larger diameter uh, rotor, we might do that. But those are the two variables that we can usually vary with not a whole lot of trouble between the power size and the speed of rotation. Um, and this is where our uh, infinity equations come in. Um, let's see, we, we have the fan speed is directly proportional to the flow rate. That's, that's the easy one. I think the pressure is so P, P2 over P1 is is that right? I, I can't remember these. I have to, I have to them up myself. I don't use them that often. I think it's RPM instead of the flow rate. Oh, the RPM. I may have this right. No, no, no. So, oh, yeah. I think it's 
Yeah. It could also be n2 over n1 squared, since uh, that makes sense. Yeah, and then, and then we have uh, the, 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 the work power. So we could, you know, we could also swap out the Q's with N's. That would be fine. Okay, so um, what speed, so speed is N. So we want to find the new speed. And we're going up to 28,000 CFM uh, from our design. CFM is 20,000. N1, N1 is uh, 500 RPM. So let's see what we get. 28 divided by 20 times 500 is 700. RPM, and then for the brake horsepower, well, I can use I can use uh, RPM or I can use Q, and uh, we'll just stay with Q since that's what we wrote the equation down that. So BHP2 equals BHP1, and uh, 28,000 over 20,000 cubed, right? 28 divided by 20 cubed times 18. Gives us uh, 49. Not a lot bigger. A bigger motor. And uh, then what else? Uh, so the, the brake horsepower and static pressure. So the static pressure equals P1, and that varies with the square. Static pressure initially was three. So that is uh, the squared divided by 20 squared times three. 5.8, 5.9, 5.88. Okay, so there's a example using the Okay, got all that? Yes. All right, well, uh, I want to switch this back now to uh, water distribution. And uh, I have some examples that I passed up last time. A couple of examples to work yes. with you. and. Um, Well, I have a couple of extras here. If you need a, anybody need a sheet from last time that has the water distribution examples? Now, the, the first one, um, I need to work manually on the board here. And the second one I have worked out on my slide, my slides. Um, 
Because that one requires drawing on the graph. So let me let's pull that up. See what we have here. Okay, so we have uh, water at 140 degrees. Uh, so specific gravity is 0.99 at that temperature. And we're pumping it from a tank through 700 feet of four inch schedule 40 steel pipe. We're lifting at 50 feet and discharging it at atmospheric pressure, or the inlet is atmospheric pressure, the outlet is 15.3 PSIG. So it's 15.3 PSI higher than atmospheric. The line has some fittings, so we've got six standard right angle elbows, one gate valve and one swing check valve. A flanged pipe, and uh, the system is designed for a constant pressure drop of 2.5 feet of water per 100 feet. So this is in line with the ASHRAE standards for energy efficient pumping. Um, and I want to answer some quest questions here. What is the required pump head to push the water through this system? Um, so what we need to do here, we need to find our losses, our head losses for the pipe and for the fittings. And I'm going to reference the, uh, the tables that we, we have in the notes. Look at the fittings first. And if we go down to there's this table here, K factors for threaded pipe fittings, and then thread for flange pipe fittings. And we have um, our, our pipe size is uh, so we've got four inch schedule 40 pipe. So for a four inch pipe, nominal pipe diameter, uh, flanged welded fittings, we're gonna be on this, this line here, four inch. Um, so for our right angle elbows, so 0.31. Is, uh, each elbow is 0.31 is our K factor. And we have six of them. So six times 0.31 is 1.86 for our elbows. Then we have one open gate valve. So we come over here and we look for a gate valve. Uh, 
hard to see uh, horizontal here. Can you tell? So that would be there. 0.16, is that? Yes, it's gate valve is 0.16, which I call valve. Okay, so our gate valve is uh, 0.16 times 1 equals 0.16. And then we have one swing check valve. And that swing check valve is uh, 2.0. And there's just one of them. And we would do this for each, each section of the pipeline that is at a particular velocity because we have to multiply these by the velocity head to get the loss. But because we, we only have one straight through pipe run here, there's just a constant velocity all the way through. So we don't so we can just uh, sum these and, and then make one loss calculation. Um, so we sum these, the sum of, of the, the k's is uh, 4.2, uh, 4.02. And then for uh, the loss due to the fittings, this is the friction head loss from the fittings, it is the sum of the K. And uh, the velocity head, which is V squared over 2 G. Multiply 4.02, and uh, our velocity is our velocity given. I don't think so. How do we find out our velocity? Do we have to do Bernoulli's to find it? Yeah, well, they, yes, but the easy way to do this is to go to a, uh, we either can use the, uh, the graph, the graphs that are in the, the chapter for uh, head loss, types of various size for copper and steel, or my preferred approach is to use uh, tables for the particular pipe that we're using. And this is a steel pipe. So if you go into the notes here on page uh, two, it says uh, there's a link to table. So here's for steel pipe. So I can go to steel pipe, schedule 40, and go to my nominal pipe size, which is four inches. So there's one inch. Four inches. So here's four inch pipe, and then it gives me all the information that I need. Um, you know, if I if I know one of the one of these other parameters, we said that the uh, the design pressure loss was what 2.5 feet of water for 100 feet of pipe. So I come down my four inch pipe. So I come over to the pressure drop column. Here's feet of water per 100 feet of pipe. And I go down to my design target of 2.5. And this is really nice, because now it's going to tell me how much water I can push through this pipe to maintain that pressure loss. So uh, my, the relevant numbers here, um, the flow rate in from the GPM is there, and the velocity will be 5.2 feet per second. You know, I like four, well, four, four feet per second is one we're kind of moving towards, but 5.2 is okay. Four to six, I think we're good for an HVAC system. Uh, so our velocity is 5.2 feet per second.
and we're going to be pushing through uh, 206 GPM of water. Under those conditions. Okay, you see how we did that? Now you can get this off the graphs in the book. It's just it's hard to read the graphs kind of. Uh, it's nice because it has all the numbers that on the graphs, but I, I prefer to use tables. Okay, so uh, we can just now plug this uh, plug this in. Our velocity is 5.2 feet per second of uh, 2 times 32.2 uh, feet per second squared. So this is going to be squared. And you can see that's going to give us feet uh, this is going to be the speed of water because this is, in, this is going to come out in units of head. Um, and that is uh, 1.688 feet. So that's my loss due to the fittings alone. Just take all the k, some k factors, multiply by the velocity of head, and Note that your HF from the fittings is 1.688 feet. So we have to do the major loss as well for the, the length of pipe? Yes. Yeah. So HF for the, uh, for the straight pipe. I guess we can just put pipe. It's just the sum of the, the uh, just the total length of the pipe. So if we go back to um, seven hundred feet of pipe. So we have seven hundred feet of pipe. So the fitting loss is pretty insignificant compared to our total length of pipe. Okay, and uh, let's see. So what else do we need? We need to know what our uh, elevation head change is. So uh, we usually I just make the inlet zero or make one uh, either the inlet or the outlet zero and the other is relevant to it. To me, it's just easier to make the inlet at zero, and then the outlet elevation is relevant to the inlet elevation. So we're going to climb up 50 feet. So Z2 is 50 feet. And then uh, P1 is atmospheric pressure, which in gauge terms is zero. And then P2 is 15.3 psi g. So we're going to gain 15.3 psi of pressure. Yes. So for the, the straight pipe loss, should that 700 be multiplied by the 2.5 feet per 100 feet of loss? So it says a constant pressure drop of 2.5 feet per 100 feet, and it's 700 feet of pipe. So should that number be smaller? Yeah, thank you. Stupid air. Um, it's not 700 feet of loss. That's the length, the length of our pipe. We have to calculate that. So our because we're dropping 2.5 feet per. So 
because they're deep. <laughs> they have to get a lot of pressure. You get a really big pump. It's a big, big motor. Um, okay, so 17. Yeah, this is, I, and sometimes I make the mistake of, of uh, forgetting the 100. That, yeah, be careful. <laughs> Don't forget to divide by 100. I, I do that a lot, and I, I've been called out for it too by people checking my work. Oh, you to divide. This is another reason why it's important to have your work, have other people look at your calculations. Okay. Um, so now we're ready to apply uh, the Bernoulli equation. So we're going to use the extended Bernoulli equation where we take the friction loss into account in the pipe head. Uh, so our Bernoulli, extended Bernoulli equation says that the pump head plus our velocity head going in plus our elevation head going in uh, plus our pressure head going in so that's all of our energy going in, in, uh, in head, expressed as head, uh, is equal to uh, what's, uh, what's coming out. So everything coming out, velocity head out, plus pressure head out, plus uh, elevation head out, plus the friction, total friction. Okay, um, so we're looking for pump head. <coughs> Solve this for pump head. Plus uh, friction, and that's going to be our uh, pipe friction plus our fitting friction, right? So if we're gonna express this in terms of pressure, so our pressure out, we've got pressure out minus pressure in, professor, professor, professor in, professor out minus professor in. Time to, time to think about retiring here. So this is gonna be P2 minus P1 over the specific weight. So that deals with our pressure change and our, um, and, and this is easy because it's uh, just Z2 minus Z1 for feet. Um, and then our velocity head change in velocity head. And then our friction So we, now we just plug in. What do we do about the velocity term? What, what would you think? Can we set it to zero before the pump? Well, the velocity, pumps do not really change the velocity unless the pipe size changes. And sometimes it does. Sometimes our, uh, our outlet pipe size will be different from the inlet pipe size, and that will change the velocity. But usually, uh, this is insignificant, or if there is a, a change, even, even with a change in pipe size, this, this number tends to be, be 
really small compared to the other ones. So typically it's ignored unless we have some specific reason, significant change in pipe size, converging, diverging pipes. Um, yeah, often if it's between two tanks, the velocity is zero at the ends anyway. So the, uh, there's, no, there's no change in velocity if, 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 if there's tanks on both ends. The other terms, of course, we do need to uh, take into account. Um, so let's, uh, let's see, we've got everything uh, in there. Use this. So our HA then is going to be the pressure, the difference in pressure, P2, we come out at 30 PSI. Or was it 15? What, what, what is 15.3 uh, K? 15.3. You know, if you preferred to work with absolute pressure, if you, you, you really want to be, you know, avoid using gauge, usually in pipe work we use gauge pressure, but you would just add 14.7, so this would be 30 minus, and then um, the inlet would be atmospheric of 14.7. So you can use either one of those. Um, this would be gauge or absolute, but since we're given the values in absolute, and, and that tends to be the easiest to work with because it makes one of the, usually one of the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, it's just zero. So it's just kind of nice to work with that. So we've got 15 minus zero. Um, and the units are uh, pound force per square inch. And then we divide by a specific weight. And this is going to get us to, to a, a unit in its in head, feet. And what is the specific weight of water um, at, uh, well, this is the nice thing about the English system uh, of units is that specific weight and density are the same number. So the magnitudes are the same. Um, so the uh, density of water in standard condition, 62.4 pound mass per cubic feet, and the specific weight is also 62.4, but pound force per cubic feet. Now, strictly speaking, I would need to multiply this by 0.99. I didn't do that here, but uh, so this is going to be a little bit less than 62.4 at that temperature, 120 degrees. But uh, I, I, I'm going to just use 62.4. So if we divide by 62.4, pound force per cubic feet, and that's going to require a unit conversion from inches, so 144 square inches per square foot. And now let's make sure that comes out in feet. We want feet. And pound force cancels, square inches cancel, and you can see this will be feet. So this is our pressure change in units of feet. Okay, so that's the pressure, and then the uh, the elevation side is just uh, Z250 minus zero, and that's already in feet, so we don't have to do anything with that. Uh, and then the velocity term is zero, no change in velocity. And now we just add our our losses from friction. So our friction loss from straight pipe is 17.5. And then our fitting loss is 1.688 feet. And we sum that all, all that mess up, we get a, about 105. Feet. And uh, the, the, the The, 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 the pressure doesn't really add much. This, this term is pretty small. This is two feet. This is the dominant 
right, we're, we're the, the, our, our, most of our work is going to lift the liquid to cover that 50 feet. Uh, and then the, the friction, that adds a bit as well. Uh, but the total is 105 feet. And now, we, since we have our, our HA, our pump head, we can calculate what our, so that's A, we just answered A. What is the rate at which the pump adds energy? So then the rate at which the water, the pump adds energy, that's gonna be the water horsepower or hydraulic horsepower, so WHP, and we can use, uh, very similar to what we did with, the, with air, the uh, total pressure times the flow rate, but we need to multiply by the specific gravity when it's different from 62.4, where we're, we're at a different temperature from. Um, it's not gonna make a huge difference because it's 0.99, but we'll stick it in there since it's in the formula. And uh, over 3956 to get the horsepower, so this is gonna be 105, Feet times uh, and this 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 wants GPM, so this is feet, and that's GPM for water. And that's really nice because you know we don't have to convert gallons and cubic feet and stuff like that. Or, so go to and then 0.99 for specific gravity over 3956. And we find that uh, we've got a, a pump. We're going we're gonna to add energy to that water at the rate of 5.41 uh, horsepower. Okay. So water horsepower. So comparable to air horsepower, dealing with air. And then our brake horsepower. So 5.41. Then our brake, uh, so pump efficiency is 0.8. Okay, so brake horsepower is uh, water horsepower divided by the pump efficiency, or 5.41 horsepower divided by 0.8 gives us a 6.77 horsepower, and then here's where we need to be careful. We need to do this with our fan as well. Don't just stop and say, oh, I need a 6.77 horsepower motor, because motors don't come in that size. You have to go to the standard size, um, and that is a little table in the notes that give you the standard horsepower sizes, and the next one up will be 7.5, so we want to specify 7.5 horsepower standard motor. Okay, that gives us a little wiggle room. And uh, so uh, 7.5 horsepower is our the motor size, and then if the motor efficiency is 0.9, what is the rate at which the motor is consuming electricity? So this would be, we're doing a uh, financial analysis, which, which uh, comes with every HVAC project. You're gonna have to tell the owner or your client how much is it gonna cost for you to operate this system. And uh, so there's a cost analysis that you have to do with alongside the technical analysis. So in this case, um, we have, uh, let's see, the electric power consumption. Well, let's come over here. Right, so our, our, elect, uh, our motor efficiency is going to be The output of the motor is brake horsepower, and what goes in is electricity, electric power. And uh, so we're solving for electric power. And 
and our efficiency is 0.9. And uh, since now we're, we're going from mechanical to electrical, and electrical people do not use horsepower, um, Oh my God, I, I, I used to teach a class to electrical engineers. Before we had ME, I taught uh, electric power generation. Just kind of like a combination of, you know what you had with uh, Professor Lee? It was like that class combined with thermal. You can imagine such a class. <laughs> and uh, the electrical engineers were just so uh, annoyed by all the units that we use in the camp. And they're used to just using kilowatts, watts, kilowatt hours. Now that's just it. And then you're throwing horsepower in, you know, and, and uh, BTU, and of course you're used to that as it means, right? You just throw anything at us, uh, except for slugs. Please don't give me slugs. <laughs> that's like a peculiar fluid mechanics unit that I never see. I never ever see except in fluid mechanics textbook. Did you do slugs in fluid mechanics? I think they did it in statics. In statics? Yeah, slugs and in, in poundle. <laughs> Have you heard of poundle? It's <laughs> some kind of mechanical unit. Um, <laughs> Dime? <laughs> you know, there's all these weird units, and I think the worst is kilocalorie, which is actually equal to calorie with a big C, which is equal to 1,000 calories with a little C. Can you manage it? You know, so if you're doing nutrition, and I love to try, you know, I'm, when I use exercise equipment, I like to try to figure out how, how um, efficient my body is, so I'm looking at the power output from my exercise equipment. It's, all, you know, it's always giving me kilocalories that I'm trying to always converting back to units that, that make sense. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, okay, but uh, anyway, so we got horse, we need to go horsepower to, uh, the, actually this one is worth memorizing, just because as mechanicals, when you work at the interface between mechanics and electrical, this is a unit that comes, uh, up a lot is 0.646 kilowatts in a horsepower, or 746 watts per horsepower. So that one is one that I, I still remember, even though my capacity to memorize is weakening, but also um, a convenient one is one horsepower is 550 foot-pound force per second. And then there's a, uh, there's a BTU conversion I use a lot as well, but that one I, I tend to forget or I mess up. But anyway, we've got this one. Okay, so uh, horsepower. So this is gonna give us uh, kilowatts and uh, 6.2 kilowatts is how much electricity, or the rate at which we're gonna use electricity. And if we're paying, now see somebody operating pumps in a industrial setting is probably paying, uh, you're paying a, a, a the electric rate is complicated. You've got the, an amount based on how much you're using, how many kilowatt hours you use, but then you've got a, a rate that's based on your maximum kilowatts. Um, now, we won't worry about that. We'll just say uh, 18 cents per kilowatt hour is, uh, so uh, 0 0.18 dollars uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, and we're operating this four months out of the year. About four months out of the year. Okay, so the best way to do this, because the kilowatt hour is our electrical unit here, let's convert four months to hours. And it's worth remembering, uh, when we, especially doing the economic side of, of the analysis here, is uh, one year is equal to 87.60 hours. So four months is one third of a year. And that is, uh, I don't know if I have to do the, do the math here, 87.60 divided by 
divided by 3. So 2920 hours is how often we're, uh, how long we're using the pump per year. So 2920 hours. So 2920 hours per year. And that's going to give us money. This kilowatt cancels, kilowatt can't hour, hour. So you have dollars per year, and you can see uh, this is significant. So if you're somebody running an HVAC, you know, a big HVAC system, or a water flow system like this, uh, it's not even that big of a system. Five horsepower, I mean, there, there are hundreds of horsepower. Uh, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a pretty steep price to pay for the electricity. It's probably a little expensive for electricity. All right, so I guess we'll take a break now. Um, you see how we did that, how we, how we did the energy analysis? And it's just, it's what you did with the mechanics. It's a you know, more practical application of it, perhaps. Um, problem two, um, let's see. Uh, that uses the pump curve, and um, that one, involves making a uh, making a pump curve. So it's, it's like what we did in, there's an example in the, in the air distribution notes. This is just a similar example using water where we create, see how we create the system curve? Now I think rather than go over this in class, because I, I, I do want to get into our next material, I'm going to make a video of this. Okay, I'll post it for you so you can look at it. And that way it'll be a seamless presentation. And um, yeah, so the next homework, there'll be problems uh, related to water. This week was air. We've got water and there. Maybe some stuff, probably some stuff based on what I'm going to cover next, which is air, all air systems. We're going to try to finish with air today. We'll finish next time, I guess, because I won't scratch the surface today. But what I want to do in the rest of the time here, I want to touch on things that are uh, so subparts of the HVAC system that involves air, which I think some of you are going to use in your projects. And that means cooling towers and uh, energy recovery. I, actually, I don't know if you're going to do energy recovery or not, but uh, I was not planning to do energy recovery until I heard from our presenters, I can't remember who, but you know, actually now, building codes, especially in the city of Seattle, require that you do energy recovery in any, uh, beyond anything bigger than residential, you've got to have an energy recovery system. So energy recovery systems, I think you're going to, that's going to be part of your design, just an expectation that you include that. And another important type of a system we're starting to see more application of is DOAS dedicated outdoor air system. So I want to talk about DOAS because I think that moving forward, we're going to see a lot more applications of DOAS. And DOAS usually includes energy recovery. So you kind of get two for, you know, cover two things with one topic. So we'll look at DOAS systems and how those work. And that's going to bring us back to psychometric using the psychometric chart. So we'll do all that here in a minute. Let's take a break. All right, um, for today, uh, today the, uh, the, the reading and the, and the topic are, are focused on the system level aspect. You know, we've been looking at you know, the psychometric part and pumps and air, and now you know, going back to looking at the HVAC system as a whole. Um, the reading for today, the chapter 9 and 10 in the book, are weird. They're, it's, they're almost like little summaries of the uh, ASHRAE handbook. Um, probably not all that useful, although it mentions important aspects of the overall design. So it's like the cooling towers, they even mention DOAS, and 
uh, and how you categorize uh, all their HVAC systems. So my notes for today, which I have not posted yet, but I will do so uh, today sometime. I, I am sorry, I, I cannot create my modules uh, in time for class. I just can't do it sometimes. And I'm really sorry, I'm frustrated by that. Because ideally, in a class design, you would have all of this in Canvas by day one, of, or at least a couple, you know, a week or two before the coming to class, and I just can't do it this year. I'm really struggling to keep up. But anyway, so it's coming. Um, just taking a little time here. But what I do here, this is this is all just writing stuff for the most part. So I, I want to just show you this and let you, uh, you can download it and read it. But it, it talks about the overall design aspects. As an engineer, you know, when you begin a project, you're going to have to develop a kind of a spreadsheet where you the client says they, they want this, and you're going to think about, okay, well, we could do a centralized system or a decentralized system. That's your first decision point. Centralized or decentralized? Centralized means you've got a central plant that probably has a chiller or, or maybe a big uh, heat pump of some kind. And that's going to do all the cooling. It's going to make all the hot and cold that then gets sent out to everywhere that needs it. Or a decentralized system where each space is gonna have its own dedicated little system. The most extreme version of that would be like a window air conditioner, right? Everybody gets their own window air conditioner. Um, the next step up would be a, a, a through the wall system, like a hotel room. Yeah, through the wall, that can often do heating and cooling. But we get into commercial design or industrial design, probably the smallest scale decentralized would be a rooftop. So you put a box right over top of the room, or right over top of the building on the roof where you need heating and cooling, and you distribute those across the space. And then the whole, everything that you need is in that box, the refrigeration unit, the fan, and uh, filters and things like that. So you're gonna have to decide uh, what centralized or decentralized. And you'll have to do a cost analysis, you're gonna look at the client's budget, and, uh, and this is going to be a, 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 a result of a, of a conversation with the client or the building owner that hired you. And uh, there's some little links here that I would really urge you to explore because uh, it's nice to actually see what these things look like. So like a rooftop package unit. I think uh, the engineering, this is an engineering mindset, uh, I think. And uh, I, I love their, their videos because they, they, they go through what these are and actually show you, give you visual stimulus to see what these things look like. They're a little bit long. I think this one is about 12, 13. They tend to be 10, 12, 13 minutes. But they'll give you a sense of what these things look like. Um, And uh, then uh, in a centralized system, you know, there you probably have a chiller off somewhere, and then the, the, the hot and cold water gets sent out, and then there's a, usually a fan coil unit, which is a box that sits over each part of the building, uh, classroom or space where you're gonna deposit warmer cold air. And again, there's a little thing here showing you, so here's the water coming in. Actually, I think that's the cold water and hot water, and, a little box where you know, it's a fan that will blow and give us the nice warmer, cool air. Um, so this is just a discussion of the types of systems. And then you can further subdivide systems into uh, centralized systems. Decentralized systems, what you get is what you, you get. Um, I guess the main thing in a decentralized system is you can have ducted or unducted. You, know, you can have the big box that just sits and then it drops the air right into the space. You don't need ducts going anywhere. But you can also have a decentralized system. Maybe the box is over on the other end of the building and the, um, the air is brought over, over here. Um, but when you get to centralized systems, there, there are two subdivisions, there are two major subdivisions. And one is um, you can have a constant volume system, a constant air volume system, where the fan just moves air at a constant volume. 
volume flow rate. So you need 20,000 CFM, you're gonna get 20,000 CFM. Um, and then there's variable air volume systems where you can actually, okay, so with the constant air volume system, you need 20,000, you, you design for 20,000 CFM, you're gonna get 20,000 CFM. If you need cooler, if you need it cooler or warmer, you change the temperature of that air. So constant volume, variable temperature. With a constant air volume system, you generally have constant temperature, variable volume. So you, you throttle the speed or the volume flow rate to meet the need at a given moment. Um, and there's just some uh, discussions here of what that, uh, what these look like. So here is a uh, of the central system, our cooling towers over here, our chiller. Here we have two chilled water systems. Usually there's more than one because you have a one that serves as a backup where it can be brought in when you need, uh, when the load is especially heavy. Um, you can kick in and use both. I think here is what we have three or four. You can find a number of them. And they bring them, they stage them based on how much, what the load is. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, we're talking about all air systems here. So these are systems where the, the heating and cooling comes from blowing air into the space. But that's not the only kind of system. We can have all water systems. And those systems uh, don't use fans and, uh, or, or forced air. They might have small fans that are local, but you don't move or have to specify and pay, pay for your big fans to move uh, air around. Um, you just make hot water or cold water somewhere and you bring that hot water or cold water into the space and you kind of let the air just, uh, well like the chilled beam system. You've got cold water up there flowing in tubes and coils and uh, you can have active chilled beam or passive chilled beam and a passive chilled beam that just uses natural convection. The warm air rises up and it comes into contact with the cold tubes. It cools and then it drops <coughs> into the space and then the, it warms and rises and you just get this natural current of cool air up there, <coughs> down, warms and rises and that, that's a chill beam system. No fans, no uh, forced convection. And then very economical under certain conditions, labs and classrooms are, are nice applications of them. But in an active chilled beam system, they actually will have a fan up there that uh, it uses induction. It will suck air out of the room and, and, and kind of push it through. Um, and it also will have, um, in an active system, you usually have a separate air conditioning system that brings a little bit of cool air in. So you mix the central air with the chilled beam air and then drop the air down in space. That gives you a little more cooling than you would have with it. Passive system, but anyway, all water. We'll talk a little bit about that next. Uh, you know, once we finish with uh, with the air, but uh, air systems are much more common. Uh, we're, we're seeing more water-based or hydronic systems because they tend to be more energy efficient, and water is a better heat transfer medium than air. And I think where we're spe especially seeing uh, water become more common is uh, radiant floor systems where you, you move uh, hot water under the floor. This is what 21 Acres has. You, you use a heat pump, like a air source or water source heat pump and make hot water and just, uh, you, and you put a pipe grid under the floor and the water, it's like a big coil, you know, wire and a water pipe, plastic tubes, and you rely on uh, radiation, radiant heat, uh, radiant heat transfer to pull that air up and into the space. It's a nice way to heat because you know, the floor is nice and warm. So you can tolerate lower air temperature when you're warm down at the floor. Um, and there's all kinds of things. You know, the, the old fashioned radiators. You go into like an old school. You know, it was built 50 years ago or 100 years ago and there's these big radiators that have hot water flowing through them. And you touch them, ow! You know, really hot. 
But that's, that's a, actually a great way of heating. And a lot of that is you're, you're relying on natural convection and radiation for heating. And um, Europe still uses that. that that's, a, that's a very common form of heating there. Less so here. But we're starting to see that come back. Although now the designs are much more efficient than those old, uh, you know, those old radiators that kind of sit. But anyway, that's a, that would be a water-based system. And um, so then I just talk a little bit about the two main types of air systems, the constant air volume system. And that's, that's really what we've been looking at most of the time. This is the bread and butter HVAC system, kind of the most common, the, the traditional, where you got a space, you draw the return air out, mix in a little outdoor air, put the combination through, you know, filter it, heat, humidify, cool, dump it back in the room. And we've already analyzed that, right? We know how to do that. And, uh, but the key point here is this fan, this fan, you set it up and it just runs at a constant volume. It's moving 20,000, 15,000, 5,000 CFM. Whatever you, whatever you design for, that fan is giving you. And if you don't like that, then uh, what we do is we change the temperature. And you do that by uh, changing the temperature, or you do that by uh, increasing or decreasing the cold water flow, going through the cooling coil, or you change the flow rate of the refrigerant. This is a refrigerant coil. But you leave, the idea is to leave the volume flow the same. Um, and that's a problem. These systems have really big problems, especially in hot, humid climates. And the reason is that in order to get the humidity down to a comfortable level, 50% or even 60%, you've got to overcool. You've got to drive the dry bulb temperature down. So people are freezing to death. So people are really cold, but it's also using a lot of energy. Um, and so generally, in that situation, what you end up doing is you overcool to get good humidity, and then you reheat, you warm the air to get the dry bulb back up. Um, and we're really trying to move away from that. And some energy codes now are actually banning that, forbidding you, forbidding engineers from doing that. Because that's the easy solution. Using this kind of system, it's simple, it's cheap, quick and dirty. And uh, oh, sorry, your air's too cold. We'll just put a little heating coil in here, and then you can uh, play with that if you need. Um, so the solution. Oh, and this is just a. This is showing how you, you can actually apply this system to multiple zones. Um, and the idea is you deliver 55 degree. What you do in this situation is you look at your zones here. You do the heat transfer analysis as we've done, and you say, all right, who needs the most? Who needs the most cooling? Uh, who needs the most heat? And you, you have to design the system for the, the zone that has the greatest demand. Now what's going to happen? Okay, zone C has the greatest demand for cooling. What's that going to do to zone A and B? It's going to be cold, right? If you keep the zone C people happy, you're gonna, these people are going to be wearing sweaters. So what do you have to do? Well, you've you got to keep these people happy. So <laughs> reheat. So we're back to heating in the middle of the summer. It's 100 degrees outside, and you're heating the bloody air to get it. And again, this is not, it, it's, we're trying to get away from this. Um, but it is uh, simple. And it tends to be what we teach because you can do this kind of a system rather easily without computers and complicated calculation. Um, now we can, uh, if need be, we can add humidification in the winter time. So uh, sometimes we'll put in a little box, something that will humidify the air, especially if it's really cold climate and dry in the winter. Um, you want to moisten that air so we can add steam or hot water. And uh, and actually, the hot water system is really nice because you can use that in the summertime. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a place where it's really hot and dry. You see this a lot like in Leavenworth or uh, Spokane. Um, 
places in eastern Washington, like outdoor cafes, and they'll have these uh, sprayers that are spraying water. Have you ever sat under those? It feels really nice. Now, now what they're doing, it's a really hot day, maybe 95 degrees out, but it's really dry. So you miss this water, and that water evaporates. And when it evaporates, it actually draws heat out of the surrounding air and cools it. Right? So that liquid water evaporates and then it cools all the air around it. It makes you feel nice. And, uh, and so you can get that effect in the summertime with these systems by uh, spraying uh, water, not, not steam, but you would use water uh, into the air and, uh, and that would cool it down without the need for refrigeration. Um, when we use, I, actually I meant to use the water diagram. Um, when we spray water, the, the device is called an air washer. You might see that term used, air washer, because it also kind of cleans the air. It's like washing out the air. Uh, yeah. Okay, so to combat the problem of re having to reheat and, uh, and to not have good temperature control, variable air volume systems adjust the volume of the supply air in response to changes in cooling load without changing the temperature. So a lot of it kind of looks the same. The difference is, instead of uh, just a reheat coil, there's a box called a VAV box, a variable air volume box. So you have your, a central system that's delivering 55 degree air, typically. So here's your 55 degree air. Everybody gets 55 degree air. And then every space has a little box over top of the space that will uh, change the volume flow rate based on the thermostat setting in the space. So it gives you local control, uh, the beach zone having a, 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 its own thermostat. Um, and uh, what it looks like, you've probably seen these, you can see these hanging from ceilings in places. That's a variable air volume box. It's like a little miniature HVAC system. And it has a uh, has a fan. I guess the main parts are uh, it has a filter, a fan, and the fan is variable speed. So you can vary the speed based on how much air you need. And a damper to give you uh, control over another uh, 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 control point over how much volume of air that you're getting. And what you do is, you know, the, the, this is showing the, uh, the damper which can open and close, and it's controlled by the temperature in the space. And the differential pressure here between total and static, that difference is velocity. So by measuring, you probably did pitot tubes in, uh, it's kind of like a pitot tube. Uh, it allows you to measure the velocity and to modulate and use that signal, combine it with the temperature input and the controller, and then set that damper to give you the exact amount of air you need meet set point. And, um, and so you put these around in all the spaces, the different zones, and then everybody's happy. Uh, so this is the kind of systems we design today. Probably when you go out, this is what, if you do HVAC design, commercial HVAC, this is going to be what you design, by and large. Um, if, you do, if you do an air, all air system. There are some drawbacks to this kind of system. It's more complicated and uh, uh, costly, and there's some there's some other things here, but uh, yeah. A problem that you can have with these systems is, let's say you're in heating mode, it's really cold out, so you need a lot of heat. But suppose it's not so cold, you need less and less air, so you're, you're reducing the volume. And suddenly, you get to a point where you're not ventilating the space. So you can end up violating the code, the energy code, by not putting enough air in it. The same in the summer, if you're cooling, if you, you, know, you can get to a point where you, you dial the volume down and then you go below the allowable for, for ventilation. These systems are set up not to allow that to happen. They automatically shut off. I think it's 60% of maximum, something like that, to make sure you have proper ventilation. And then you have this dead band in the middle here when you're, uh, you're in between 
full heating and, and cooling mode, and uh, this is a mixed mode of operation. Car air conditioning systems kind of operate on the same basis because you can control the fan and you control the, how much air is coming out. Um, but anyway, that's a uh, just an overview, broad overview of the kinds of systems, and uh, and then there is a uh, there's actually a presentation that goes with it. And uh, this will have to wait until uh, mo uh, Monday. But we'll look at some components of the all-air system. Uh, exhaust air recovery, dedicated outdoor air system, and cooling power. So we'll do that on Monday. Thank you. You all have a good weekend.